Welcome to our show, Meaning and Motivation, where we explore the many ways that we make meaning together and why do we do what we do, our motivation. I'm your host, Tim Thompson, and with us today is Dr. Jim Moran, and Jim is the interim president of Edinburgh University and also the vice chancellor for academic and student affairs with the PA. Right. State Thanks. System. Yep. I'll be, uh, as of June 1, I'll be going back to the state system office, but have truly enjoyed my year here at Edinburgh. So. I know that many people have enjoyed your year here too and some have been saying it'd be nice if you could stay and help out with everything. You, you know th this is a place that's interesting that you get attached to so quickly and it is going to be hard to leave because uh, the people here well, first were so welcoming mm -hmm. to me but there's such an energy here uh, in Edinburgh both in the community and at the university that it really has made it uh, a truly enjoyable year. I've learned a lot. Uh, when I go back to the state system office, I will have a much, uh, a lot different perspective, a lot more wisdom, and uh, I'll miss the people here, clearly. The you know faculty, staff, students, and people in the community. Right, you're right. And there is a kind of energy here. That's there is. Yeah. Um, people believe in the place and believe in what they do. And I think that's one of the things that creates that energy and I think bodes well for the, for the future. And uh, Dr. Wallman coming in on, on June 1 will, I am sure, uh, get easily attached to this place and be a, a great uh, president for Edinburgh moving forward. Right, good. Well, what interested me in talking to you before is I found out that you were involved in research and with creativity and education. Can you tell me a little bit about that research? First? Sure. We, I got involved in this because of uh, my background is in child and family studies. And in looking at kind of how that framed uh, the development of children, got very interested in the development of creativity and creative potential. Uh, my early work, uh, especially when we was at Virginia Tech and Oklahoma State, focused on uh, that development of that creative potential, three, four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. uh, which is an interesting time of child's life because uh, they explore everything. Uh -huh. <laughs> the concept of their world is uh, very much involved in exploration, uh, trying to figure out the world. Uh, and what we see, I think, uh, at that time is developing some of the frameworks, the orientations that lead to uh, creativity later on. Mm -hmm. I just saw something the other day about uh, divergent thinking and youth, and they, they said they, they tested all the uh, children in kindergarten that they tested, and, and they were like 95% of them were at the genius level. And then it was a longitudinal study, so they tested them again at 8 to 10 years old and 13 to 15, and they said yeah. that that divergent thinking just dropped off. There tends to be that drop off, especially down around fourth grade. But we, and we, we talk about divergent thinking, and one of the things, I still remember an example that we had. When you ask children, for example, tell me all the things you can think of that are red. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a wagon, an apple, a cardinal. That's kind of common responses that often come out first. And the more responses the child has, the more divergent, innovative responses. And I still remember a response from uh, one of the children when we asked, tell me all the things you can think of that are red. And she said, a fireman painting a picture of himself. <laughs> now, that response is a little different than an apple. And it's those kind of things that kind of get you excited about um, studying creativity and, and, and what goes on. We also got responses like chicken pox and a variety of things. But um, what you find is uh, children move a little more toward the right answer orientation, that there's a single right answer that they're searching for rather than uh, coming up with a, a number of different ideas, uh, one of which will be kind of creative. Is that uh, single right answer idea something that uh, hurts divergent thing? Is that something like our educational process? Yeah, it clearly does. Now you have to, you know, you have to have some of the you know, convergent thinking, some of the right answer for them, because you, you have to have a base on which to uh, jump, jump off from. But I think there is this tendency to look for the right answer. Sometimes it's from social pressure. Mm -hmm. um, gee, will I look um, odd or I, mm -hmm. if I kind of go out on, on a, a limb a little too much. But sometimes it also comes from uh, the teacher. It, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. We had um, parents interact with children doing some Legos mm -hmm. one time. And we told the parents, teach your child how to do this. 
Mm -hmm. We all, all told another group of parents, play with your child with this. Mm -hmm. And what you found is that what they constructed was very much more limited under the teach your oh. child as opposed to kind of play with your child. And I think that's part of what, what happens is um, the idea of encouraging um, what can be rather than what needs to be is part of that process. Right. Yeah. Now, do we run into problems because there are so many situations of what needs to be? So, for, for instance, when you talk about standardized testing versus uh, the need for divergent thinking, are they running yeah. in opposite directions? Sometimes direction? they do run you know, in, in conflict with each other, though there has been a move a little more in terms of some of the standardized testing to focus a little more on problem solving. Mm -hmm. uh, which can enable you to get a little more into the critical thinking, the, the creative kind of problem solving. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the things that I see. I see creativity is really one of the fundamental principles of problem solving. So, again, you, you ha often have to have a good knowledge of, let's say, what objects can do before you can think about what I can do with the object. And so there's that, there is that balance, but there is that tendency to focus so much on you know, the one way to do things. Mm -hmm. even, even interesting, you know, here's, the, here's the answer to the math problem, and now you have to show me the right way to have gotten to that answer, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, gee, there are a number of different ways to solve the problem. Um, but right. it's an interesting model that sometimes we restrict even the way to get to the solution. Right. Yeah. Do you see, now we're aware of this, we're aware of the need for divergent yeah. thinking, creative thinking and so forth, do you see any changes in education that are uh, moving more towards that awareness? Well, at one time I hope there <laughs> was. and um, It gets into um, the way uh, we prepare our teachers and I think you're right. I, I think there is this framework of trying to prepare teachers such that they can, and parents, I think, so that they can uh, recognize there are different ways of, of solving problems. One of the things that we, we talked about is, especially parents and teachers have to have a fair amount of what we'll call ambiguity tolerance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, okay, the room's gonna be a little messy. The, 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 not everybody is gonna be kind of on that same pace. You know, if you're that, that parent and the child doing something, you, you know, you don't have to clean it up every day. You know, you can have that material laid out. Um, sometimes it's even as simple as I think for teachers is when we teach teachers, um, we say, okay, I want a lesson plan. Well, sometimes that lesson plan you don't always stick to uh, mm -hmm. to enable that and, and do that adaptation. And those are some of the things that uh, if you have confidence as a teacher or parent, you understand the theory behind what you're doing not just how to do it in the, as I said, the rote way of doing things, then you're able to have a little more flexibility. And I right. think that's part of that whole process of, of and especially with young children, letting them take you where they go because they will take you in amazing uh, directions. Right. Now, but with the teachers and the parents, are there pressures to, you know, like oh. we, we'd love to allow flexibility and everything, but are there pressures to keep sure. things, you know, on track? And there are, and, and um, even though when you look at state standards, mm -hmm. the, uh, oftentimes problem solving, creativity, that kind of creative thought is built into those. It's, part of it is the time pressure mm -hmm. uh, in terms of trying to do too much. Um, I remember hearing um, a person talk about if you try to accomplish everything that you were supposed to accomplish in a year, they're just, you, you'd be going like 24 hours a day, you know, 365 days a year uh, instead of 180 days school year. Um, and that's part of it. Sometimes we've um, tried to focus so much on so much content that we forget about a little bit the process mm -hmm. and focus both in terms of our educational goals, both in terms of content, but also in terms of process of how to think about the material, moving to um, different levels or applying your knowledge in different ways mm -hmm. and not just moving on to the next right. uh, item. And, and uh, I think that's a different way of thinking. And I've seen some of that being developed in some of state standards. And as a teacher, if you understand that, 
I think you're able to get uh, children to where they need to be uh, <laughs> without um, saying, I have to do this every, every, you know, follow this each and every day, as opposed to say, the point is, at the end of the week, I want children to be able to do this, and how you get there right. um, is important. Again, children still be, need to be able to do the math and, right. and do the writing, and, and there's a, been a little bit of a change um, in the framework of um, called the Common Core, these standards now uh, for children uh, kind of developed through third grade through twelfth grade, mm -hmm. um, and I think that has a little better understanding of just the comprehension of information rather than just the, if you will, the regurgitation of information. Right. When you talk about the standards for uh, like the state, and uh, is it difficult because? When you're talking about the process of education, you're talking about something that's more of a qualitative thing that can't easily be quantified or measured. Or and that is a part of the difficulty, is that we, we have to look at developing some more measures that are more of that, again, measure some of the complex skills rather than some of the thinking skills. One of the, um, some more research that I had done earlier was looking at uh, detrimental effects of reward, for example. We found out when you rewarded children, uh, the responses to simple qu problems came out better, mm -hmm. but the solutions to complex problems came out actually worse. Mm -hmm. uh, again, they kind of limited their thinking, uh, focusing on a right answer and trying to th rather than trying to think about things in a much more complex manner. Now, right. interestingly, this year Edinburgh has been involved in an international uh, project to look at can we assess kind of complex problem solving and critical thinking on an international measure. Um, there, most of the rankings that come out for you know, the United States compared to other countries have used more of the multiple choice format. Well, we're, Edinburgh is one of ten institutions representing the United States in this international study with Norway, Denmark, Korea, Mexico, Kuwait. Um, that are trying to develop a much more complex problem solving model in terms of assessing um, students thinking. Wow. Yeah. And what kind of directions is that taking right now? We don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> we actually just this this semester I've uh, got some students involved in that and uh, we're very proud that of the um, ten institutions that are representing the United States uh -huh. in this new development of this new assessment internationally, uh, we're one of those. Right. And, yeah. That's very cool. Well, what about higher education? When you start talking about applying creativity, uh, it, are, are we stuck in an old uh, way of doing things? Or You know, and, and again, I think when there's so much conversation now about talking about student learning outcomes and in, in higher ed. And I think we have to look at understanding, again, both the content as well as the process. You know, I'll just take history. Um, I was a history and psychology major as an undergraduate. Mm -hmm. But you do need some basic information. Now, I don't know that you need to memorize all the facts, especially in today's world, quite honestly, where access to information is so different in terms of utilizing the Internet. But once you have, if you have a good understanding of some of the basic, um, you know, content, then you move to the process. So, for example, your early courses may be in a sequence, uh, may be focused in a, let's get some of the content down, let's understand a little bit of the, you know, Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but then you understand, you know, the history of that written by a southern author and a northern author are a little different what's the perspective, how would that have changed, what would have happened had Maryland gone to the Confederacy, mm -hmm. those kind of things, and now put your thoughts together, write the 20-page term paper, uh, look at the complexity of mm -hmm. some of the issues. So we have to think, I think, in higher education with a whole curriculum, not just a series of courses mm -hmm. um, that are disconnected, because I might say that, okay, I'll provide the content, but I need you to provide the process. So students are going to be writing the 20-page the term paper in your class. And, yeah, that class has to be a little smaller than my class. Mm -hmm. um, but we're working on this developing thinking skills. 
mm -hmm. uh, based in some good understanding of, of material. But those are the key things, and that's where problem solving, that's where the creativity comes in. Because what you're writing as that senior is something that may never have been written before. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of times in our testing, even essays, sometimes we use objective essays. I always go back, in child development, we use Piaget's theory. Well, what are the six stages of Piaget? Well, that's an objective essay question. Mm -hmm. How do those six stages compare to Freud's six stages people haven't written on, and yet that's what kind of creates some of the, the pressure of thinking in students that move them to a different level. So when they go out in the world, mm -hmm. whether, whether that be a teacher, whether that be in business, they're able to think a little differently of problems they've never been handed before. Right. And that's the task. I was watching a video by Sir Ken Robinson yeah. on his uh, innovation and education expert, and he was talking about the need for a paradigm shift yeah. in education. He said, we're, we're kind of built too much from the Industrial Revolution Absolutely. and the Enlightenment, and we're, and we're too much like uh, we need to change something from this factory-like education. Yes, and that's, I mean, and, you know, I always go back to Thomas Kuhn's book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, which uh, is interesting because it always suggests that, you know, some of that innovation comes from people outside the field a little bit. And I think um, I use that really when we talk about how important diversity at the institu institution is, uh -huh. whether that be diversity of cultural perspective, background, experiences. I think that's one of the places in which innovation comes from. So if you're able to move into a framework of, again, instead of doing things the way we've always done it, and you know, you know, part of the task as a faculty member that we really struggled with in, in dealing with creativity is we had to shift the way we were teaching. Because mm -hmm. if we wanted to model for our potential teachers how to promote creativity in young children, we had to teach differently and move from much more of the lecture rope model into a much more problem solving project based model. Mm -hmm. um, and that was an interesting transition that, that we had. And uh, when I was at Tennessee, we really did make a major shift in the way we taught. Um, that at, at the university level. At the university were, level. Yeah. Because if you're going to, if you're expecting your teachers of four-year-olds to go out and focus a little more on project-based learning, mm -hmm. you have to teach them in a project-based model. So they get the modeling, they experience it, and it creates that same um, ambiguity, tolerance, that same innovation in them uh, because they've, they've seen it that you can do it as a faculty member yourself. Right. When you talk about a project-based model, what are the basics of that? Well, it can, be, it can really be in, in any kind of framework, and this is part of the transition we've seen in higher education. Um, you know, I taught a uh, uh, required course for seniors uh, at the University of Tennessee, and our project was Students went out and they researched uh, any project related to human ecology. It may have been in nutrition, it may be in hotel, restaurant, maybe in child family studies. I put them together in interdisciplinary teams, mm -hmm. create different thinking, and their project was actually present a grant proposal to a foundation panel. And I'd bring people in from the community as the foundation panel chief of police, the mayor, the uh, people on foundation. So this was real and it this had was real. Um, yeah. And actually one year we actually did a real project and the student actually got a grant. Uh, um, but the idea then was they had to put their thinking together because we also, in, in, uh, from different disciplines, to solve problems that were more uh, around the issues of real people in real time. Uh, and by dealing with that, um, it stretched them. And they also had to work, learn to work together, uh, right. which is also part of that um, transition in higher education that we've seen. Uh, and working in a team takes some skills. Uh, yeah. We often do a lot of group projects, right. but that's a little different than projects working in a team where everybody's got to contribute. And right. it's interesting. We had students grade each other. And we actually did have one team that fired somebody on their team. <laughs> so the student failed a required course based on 
the Being members fired. of the team going, you didn't contribute. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. But that's what's fun. You know, I, if there's one thing I, I miss. I do miss that being in the classroom. Uh -huh. Truly Do you think, can that be done uh, across the board in all yes. disciplines? All you can Absolutely. Now, it would take a different form in, in, in most disciplines, but a lot of people suggest, um, and I haven't been as involved in, for example, some of the science education, but I remember reading some things that suggest that project-based learning is one of the key things in science. Um, the uh, state had a grant from um, Annenberg that looked at some professional development for existing teachers that really moved much more into project-based types mm -hmm. of learning. And um, there are some people have suggested coming into college that there's not a shortage of people in science and math in September, but by December there is. And partly that's the way we teach it. Um, so the concept of being able to energize uh, students' excitement about fields is the more, and we found with the young children, hands-on is how you learn. Um, and if you can connect your uh, classroom learning to something grounded in your experience, that's what's really important. Right. I mean, even these kind of events that we have in the communication and broadcasting, mm -hmm. the students that can get connected into the um, the actual exper experiential kind of learning is what really kind of gets them uh, right. energized and says, what I learned in the classroom, I can put into place and bring back what I, what the experiences I've had in in uh, the this kind of a studio back into their classroom makes them uh, understand the material so much better. Right, and, and it seems easy for us in communication, whether it be in the TV studio yeah. or setting up public relations programs or whatever to make it exciting and cool and so forth, but to make science and math cool, you know. Science, we, science is part of our everyday environment. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, much of what the four-year-old children try to deal with when they're trying to understand the world Right. is uh, science, is physics, is right. some of those types of things, the makeup of material. I had a child ask me, you know, why is fire not real? Uh, for me, that was a tough question to answer. <laughs> yeah. But that's a scientific question. Uh -huh. um, so science, science is, is, is part of that. Math, again, we do so much math, sometimes it's informal. Sometimes, mm -hmm. And how to connect that informal kind of math. Um, mm -hmm. And, and understanding the concept of number, understanding the concept of even what's on the written page, the connection between these, you know, arbitrary symbols mm -hmm. and meaning. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we forget how complex that that learning is. Right. And children pick it up. Um, not all children, and that's what makes it, uh, as a teacher, kind of complex to understand that, um, both in terms of math and and, and reading. You've got some artificial symbols, mm -hmm. but they're connected to, to something important. And, and that task of symbol to meaning is um, part of the joy of teaching at yeah. that age. Yeah. It really is. And yeah. students are picking it up at different rates yeah. and different levels. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, there, yeah. that's something, for example. But again, children learn to read different ways. But there's something that's, you know, one example of kind of a convergent task mm -hmm. that We've got to make sure children have some of that basic understanding of number, basic understanding of reading, because that then opens up the world to them later on. Mm -hmm. uh, and without that, their creativity is limited, right. their problem solving is limited, their ability to really extend beyond um, the classroom is limited. And, and that's going to be crucial and throughout crucial. life. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you had some advice for educators on how to encourage uh, creative thinking, divergent thinking, problem solving. Uh, yeah, it's, it's I, I, go, would, I go back to some of the kind of little tasks that we have for children. And there's uh, one task where they look at, a, look at a picture and they're asked, you know, what's wrong with this picture? Uh -huh. um, one of the things I ask is, how could that be? You know, you can have a three-legged stool, uh -huh. but a three-legged stool could work if the, you know, weighting of each of the legs is very different. Uh -huh. um, and so what you, what you need to break out of is trying to, th again, think about 
the, uh, the next level. What if? What can be? Um, you, you've said in what way are, again, these things are alike, but what are, thing, what are ways they can be different? How do you think that second level question? Also, for children, listen to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if you listen to them and let them lead some of the um, learning, it's a fascinating process in life. So, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been a pleasure having you here today with us. And well, as you can tell, I get fired up about this. I love, love talking about it. So. Yeah. 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 Well, the whole subject of creativity, I think, you know, yeah. we're just really starting to. You know, it is. For all the years that we've studied it, we've got a long way to go to really understand it mm -hmm. uh, and to really, you know, it is, we talk about even from, a, from an economic perspective, it's from creativity, from innovation that the new economy comes from. And right. that's what's going to be fun. Right. Good. Well, hopefully we can get past some of the things that are inhibiting creativity in education and really so, start Tim. to enhance and build so. on that. So. It's been fun talking to you. Jim, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you Thank for you. being on the show. Okay. Yep.